As you are, let me uh, invite you to turn with me to uh, the New Testament book of Romans and the fifth chapter, and we're going to be um, reading a, a number of verses from that fifth chapter. We are in the middle of our series we've called the Five Solas, where we're looking at these kind of themes that were prevalent in the Protestant Reformation. Uh, October contains uh, the, the Sunday at the end of the month called Reformation Sunday that kind of recognizes historically this moment uh, in history. And so we're, we're plumbing some of the themes of the great Protestant Reformation. Today we're looking at uh, grace alone, sola gratia. And uh, Paul kind of helps us get into this. This is a little bit wordy. Sometimes Paul gets that way. <laughs> but, uh, but, but hang with me because we're going we're gonna to try to unpack this theme a little bit this morning. So... He says this, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there's no law, And yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men." For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where the sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's where we're going to pause all of this, my friends. Cover to cover is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you for the grace that it reminds us of. Because quite frankly, we need it. Every single one of us, Lord. We are desperately in need of your grace. So would you come, Holy Spirit, and quicken your word in our hearing this morning. And deepen our our understanding and our embrace of your amazing, lavish grace. Because we ask it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to begin this morning uh, talking about baseball. And I thought it was fitting that, um, as we do, we probably need to take a moment of silence for the Braves. So would you pray with me? (laughs) That was painful. But next season, right? Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. Well, something happened on April 8th, 2008 in the professional sports world that rarely happens. You almost never see this kind of thing on display. It happened in Boston, in Fenway Park, the famed uh, Fenway Park, the baseball park there with the Boston Red Sox. And the the, the fans and the team members were welcoming back one of their own who had been away for many, many years. This individual had played on uh, the Red Sox for a number of years, has a stellar career, lots of accomplishments, lots of good stats. He's sort of borderline Hall of Fame kind of player. And he was on the team that made it to the 1986 World Series against the New York Mets. 
which was a series that went back and forth in the early games uh, and eventually got tied to a piece. And then the Red Sox went up three games to two. And in game six, they were on the verge of clinching their first World Series title in 68 years. The curse was about to be broken for the Red Sox. And there was all kinds of anticipation and excitement and energy around this opportunity that, that had come. Well, as it turned out, the game went a little bit back and forth. The Red Sox took an early lead, and then the Mets came back to tie it up. In fact, tied it up in the ninth inning, so they had to go into extra innings. And it was the tenth inning. And the Red Sox were, it was the bottom of the tenth. The Red Sox were on the mound. The pitcher was throwing good pitches. They had two outs. The batter at the plate was the Mets' Mookie Wilson, who took the count to three and two. So the Red Sox are one out away from clinching the World Series title. And Mookie Wilson hits a line drive down the first baseline, and first baseman for the Boston Red Sox, Bill Buckner, lets it go right through his legs. And they lost game six. And they went on to lose game seven. And the fans of Boston and the press and the media were not happy. And they excoriated Bill Buckner. They derided him. They criticized him. There were even death threats made against him and his family because he had blown this opportunity badly in front of everybody. A simple ground ball that you just bend down and scoop up, touch the bag, and you've won the World Series. And the fans in the press let him have it for years afterwards, which makes what happened on April 8, 2008, all the more remarkable, because the team members and the fans of Boston stood up for a solid four minutes in a standing ovation as Bill Buckner took the mound to throw out the first pitch of that game. And he was later asked if he had any second thoughts about coming back to Boston and appearing there in Fenway and throwing out the first pitch. And he said, well, <laughs> I had a lot to work through. I had to forgive because what happened to me in the aftermath of all that and to my family was devastating and it hurt deeply. And in that moment in Fenway Park, the team and the fans of the Boston Red Sox extended grace to Bill Buckner. And he in turn through his forgiveness and his presence there, extended grace to them. You don't see that very often in the world of professional sports, especially when you've got a rabid fan base like the Red Sox do. There's a powerful moment of grace that walks hand in glove with forgiveness. Those things go together. When you extend forgiveness to someone, you are by definition offering them the gift of grace. Have you ever found yourself in need of grace? Or facing the challenge of trying to extend grace to someone? Someone who hurt you? Someone you didn't feel like deserved it? I have. It's not easy sometimes. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of grace. Maybe there was some moment where you hurt someone. You did something that caused injury or hurt to someone. Or maybe, maybe you were just on the receiving end of someone's kindness and generosity and graciousness just because they wanted to be gracious to you and give you something or do something for you. And you knew in the receipt of that gift or that action or that kindness or whatever it was, you knew in that moment, I don't deserve this. What did I do to deserve this? And you know the answer to that is nothing, right? 
And in that moment, when you know the answer to that question is nothing, you know you are in the presence of grace. And it's a beautiful thing. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is driving at in this passage from Romans 5. He talks about it, in fact, all the time in, in his different letters. In fact, if you go to Ephesians 2, he says this in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ, for by grace you have been saved. Or in the text we looked at this morning, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps, perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. You see, the reality is, even though you and I continually turn our backs on God, go our own way, do our own thing, chart our own course, even though we reject his love, he will never stop loving us. Amen. Even though we decide to go our way, he will never stop chasing after us. Even though we make decisions that are destructive and, and, and deadly to us, he comes again and again and again in relentless love and grace and mercy to show us compassion. He doesn't have to, and we don't deserve it. But that's why it's called grace. It's all grace. There is nothing, not one thing you or I can do to earn that or deserve it. No matter how hard we try, no matter how good we try to be, no matter how much effort we, we expend trying to be some, a better version of ourselves, it'll never be enough. We all miss the mark, right? Right? In fact, that's what the, 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 the sort of the, the ancient word picture is behind the word sin. It's actually an old archery term, which means to, 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 to shoot the arrow at the target and for the arrow to fall short of the target. It doesn't hit the mark. It misses. No matter how good and skilled the archer is, it still misses. Any of you who've ever shot a bow and arrow can appreciate that, <laughs> Right? It, it, it just, it, no matter how hard we try, no matter how good we think we are, we never can measure up. And our efforts don't stand up over time. They don't stand the test of time. We can't save ourselves. And that's what Luther and the other Protestant reformers were so passionate to try to help the church understand. And, and one of the things that that compelled Luther and the other reformers was not only some of the misunderstandings of the Catholic Church of their day and the way that they were living things out in terms of what we would call works righteousness. That was part of it. But there was another compelling driving force that was interior for Luther and some of the other reformers when they looked at their own soul, at their own spirit, at their own tendency to place their trust in their own efforts in their own ability, in their own attempts to be good enough. And when they looked inside their own hearts, they saw that the human heart is, as they often described it, desperately wicked and totally depraved. And that's why they were so insistent on things like grace alone. And I think it's fitting for us to be talking about grace alone on the heels of our discussion last week about faith alone. Because when you stop and think about it, if there's no grace involved, then our ability to have faith becomes a work in and of itself, doesn't it? And we can sort of pat ourselves on the back that I have, I, I have faith, I have trusted Christ. I did this. I did it myself. Me, myself, and I did this. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. 
were it not for the grace of God, we couldn't even have faith. We couldn't even begin to have faith. It's faith alone, yes, but it's grace alone that makes the faith alone possible. In recognition that there's no way, there's just no way we can do it. We can't earn it. It reminds me of a, I think a tragic storyline on the big screen. Any of you remember the, uh, the movie back in the 90s, Saving Private Ryan with Tom Hanks and Matt Damon? It's an interesting study in human nature. As the storyline goes that um, Matt Damon's character is, is Private uh, James Francis Ryan. He's fighting in World War II. It's the, it's the invasion of uh, Omaha Beach, Normandy, and D-Day, and so forth. And this group is sort of led by um, Tom Hanks' character, Captain John Miller, which eventually receives orders after they come ashore to go and find Private Ryan, who's somewhere deep in country, because his three brothers have been killed in action, and he's the only surviving son of their family. And John Miller, Captain Miller, has been given orders to take a group and go find Private Ryan and bring him home so that his mom doesn't lose her last remaining son. And my apologies to those of you who haven't seen it because I'm going to spoil it for you. But Tom Hanks and his crew eventually find him, and there's a pitched battle with the Germans in their attempts to, to rescue him. First, he doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to be rescued. He doesn't want to leave the fighting. But Captain Miller says, we have orders. You've got to go home. And in this pitched battle, the captain gets shot. And in his dying moments, Private Ryan is kneeling beside him. And Captain Miller very weakly whispers into his ear, James, earn this. Earn this. Which then saddles Private James Ryan with this incredible, unbearable weight for the rest of his life of trying to be good enough to merit the death of the captain who came to rescue him. And in one of the closing scenes of the film, an older Private Ryan is visiting the cemetery at Normandy with his family. And he visits Captain Miller's grave, and his wife comes up to him. He's quite, they're both advanced in years. And he's tearful and shaken, and he looks at her he says, tell me I've been good enough. Tell me I've led a good life. Even at that late stage of his life, he was still bearing the burden of trying to be good enough. Because he was trying to earn it. And the fact of the matter is, for you and me, we can't. That's not a burden we can bear, nor were we meant to. That's why it's all grace. It's all grace. It's all grace. And Paul keeps trying to drive that point home to his friends in the church in Rome. And, and he's got a mixed group there, actually. And there's some Jews and some Gentiles. Rome was a major metropolitan area of that day, so it attracted people from all over the world. And he's trying to speak to both groups. And if you read the early chapters, the ones preceding the, the, the part that we read today, there's a little bit of this back and forth between talking about the Gentiles and the Jews. And he ultimately concludes that neither group has any standing, if you will, before Almighty God, that can justify themselves. He uses that word frequently in our text and, and several times throughout Romans, the word justify or justification. It's a legal term that means someone declares you someone, something. You are declared. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it, but you are declared something. It's a declarative statement. In this case, in this case you are 
declared to be righteous. You are declared to be forgiven in spite of the fact that you don't deserve it. It's, if you can imagine sort of this, this, this courtroom scene, as it were, because it's really, that's sort of the, the imagery behind some of this. Imagine this, this big courtroom scene, and God, is the, God the Father is the judge. And, and, and Paul brings into the courtroom, in a sense, the whole world, Jews and Gentiles alike. And they're seated at the defendant's table. The whole world is. And among them is a guy named Dave Goebel. And we're all seated there at the defendant's table. And in comes the first witness. And it's Moses. And he's bringing the law with him. He says, Your Honor, Dave Goebel is a lawbreaker. In fact, he's broken it repeatedly. And then the prosecution calls the second witness. It's Satan. We all know him. He's the accuser of the brethren, right? And he knows all the dirt. He knows where all the, the skeletons are, all the, the dark inclinations of my heart and the, the secret sins and all the stuff, that, the, the, the history and the, the, the yuck that is sometimes my brokenness. He knows it all and he begins to catalog it over and over again before the court, before the judge, before everyone. And then my defense attorney gets up from the table. It's a guy named Jesus. And he approaches the bench. But here's the interesting thing. He's not just my defense attorney. He's related to the judge. He's the son of the judge. And when he approaches the bench, he doesn't do it in all kind of a formal, you know, your honor and so forth. He just kind of leans forward and says, hey, dad. Look, yeah, all this is true. But you and I both know the death penalty has already been paid for him. And at that moment, a smile breaks out across the judge's face. And he bangs the gavel. Not guilty. You're free to go. You are justified. It is just as if you had never sinned. You are free to go. You are innocent because of my son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's just grace. Not grace and something. I know sometimes we feel like, yeah, but if we go down that, 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 that road too far, anything goes. Not when you know Jesus. Not when you know the Holy Spirit and the heart of the Father. Not when you know what happens to a heart that has been transformed by grace. When a heart is transformed by grace, it is a life lived in gratitude. I don't know about you, but I would be utterly lost without God's grace. I am so grateful for His grace. Where would we be if it were up to you and me? We'd be a mess. An utter mess. Worse than we are. I'm so grateful for the grace of God. And I'm grateful when people like you show me grace. Because I need it from you too. Because I don't know if you've noticed over the last four and a half years, but I ain't perfect. I fall short of God, your expectations, my own. None of us is perfect. We all need grace. Is there someone in your life right now whom you're thinking of that the Holy Spirit might be bringing to your mind? Who you think, yeah, they don't deserve it. <laughs> but maybe the Holy Spirit is pricking your conscience a little bit right now saying, I want you to be gracious, gracious to them. I want you to extend grace. Of course they don't deserve it. That's not the point. It wouldn't be grace if they did. Yes, my friends, it's only grace. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to start life afresh and anew with you, Lord. 
What a good and gracious, merciful King and Father you are. Lord, I pray that you would help us to truly embrace the grace we all need on a daily basis. And I pray that you would help us to extend grace to each other, Lord, and not to, not to hold one another to a standard that is unlike your heart and your character, Lord. Lord, give us grace to spur one another on to greater measures of faith and good deeds, Lord, that we might become more and more greatly conformed to the image of Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.